Welcome to Follow Him, a weekly podcast dedicated to helping individuals and families with their Come Follow Me study. I'm Hank Smith. And I'm John, by the way. We love to learn. We love to laugh. We want to learn and laugh with you. As together, we follow Him. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Follow Him. My name is Hank Smith. I am your host. I am here with my amazing Technicolor co-host, <laughs> John, by the way. John, by the way. I grew up in the black and white era of the Andy Griffith show, so Technicolor uh, was a big deal when I was a kid. They used to say, in color on TV. And <laughs> yeah. There were a lot of good life lessons out of Andy Griffith, by the way. <laughs> oh, best show ever. Yeah. John knows every episode. I've heard most of them. I've never seen them, but I've watched them from John. Yeah. John, you're amazing Technicolor because we are talking about one of the most famous stories ever. So we wanted to bring on a guest who could help us understand this incredible story even better. Tell us who's with us. Absolutely. And she is back. We've had Sister Anderson before, Lily De Hoyos Anderson as a first generation American. Her mother is French and her father is Mexican. She grew up in Indiana. But when she started high school, both her parents began teaching at BYU. So the family moved to Provo and she graduated from Provo High School. She graduated from BYU in sociology and married Chris Anderson. They had eight children in 12 years. They are affectionately referred to as the alphabet kids. I love this because their names are Adam, Bethany, Caitlin, Dominic, Eden, Faith, Graydon, and Harper. After almost 20 years of being a full-time homemaker, Sister Anderson decided to return to school, complete a master's in social work from UNLV and a PhD in marriage, family, and human development from BYU, where she taught for several years in the School of Family Life. She's a licensed clinical social worker, has a private practice in individual marriage and family counseling, and she has a new podcast called Choosing Glory. Do you want to tell us more about that, Willie? Well, it's all because I was a guest on Follow Him. <laughs> this was not on my radar. I just thought I would have a fun time being a guest with you guys last year. I got a lot of feedback from people who encouraged me to consider this. And, you know, particularly my children-in-law, which was really, really a, a great compliment. But they were like, you know, this... It's good to have another voice out there. I finally took the, the plunge. I did a lot of praying about it, but felt like it would be something to try. So I have really enjoyed that. I like what you said, Lily, another voice out there. And that's how we look at it. We're so thankful that there are so many other voices out there that defending Absolutely. truth and defending Joseph Smith and things like that. So that's great. Lily, let's jump in. Tell us about Joseph and his family, what he did. Most of us have had this soundtrack of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dream Code going through our heads as we've read about Joseph. And it is a delightful uh, little production piece. Not always right. exactly accurate, but uh, but we forgive yeah. it because it's so clever. And and it does highlight in, in really quite a, a generous and lovely way, you know, this amazing, amazing prophet. So really a privilege to talk about Joseph. I wanted to start with just a kind of a perspective, and maybe you've discussed this before, Genesis particularly is a very brief sketch of this history, and I think it's good for people to remember. Give it a little latitude when, when there's something that we don't fully understand. We can speculate about some things, but the record is pretty scanty. I mean, I looked up some things when I started again on the Old Testament this year. The entire book covers about 4,000 years, right? And it's in just <laughs> under 1,200 pages. You may miss something along the way. <laughs> Even more extreme is that Genesis covers over half of those 4,000 years. It covers about 2,200 years. The estimates vary a little bit, but it's pretty close to that. So we're, we're talking about 55% of the time period covered by the Old Testament is covered in 6.5% of the total length of the book. And as you said, it's not exactly proportionate because we do spend more time on Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So there are a few more chapters devoted to that. But nevertheless, we're talking about 78 pages in Genesis that have 50 chapters, and we're covering 2,200 years. So I, I just want people to appreciate that. If, if there are things that they feel are not fully fleshed out, well, that's right. That's right. This is, this is a pretty brief record of these marvelous and amazing events. And nevertheless, we have this record preserved so that we can learn 
from these amazing people who lived at the beginnings of the world and established these believers. You know, we have, we have strong believers, these patriarchs that came down and the women that were with them. So just be patient as we read this book. I hope everybody can be a little patient and, and understand that there's much more to be revealed to flesh out these stories, but the, the themes are clear. The themes are clear, and the gospel has been revealed in every dispensation, and they had all they needed, as we have all that we need. But we do live in a very generous time. To think that we live in a dispensation where all these materials are available and are on our on our phones. I hope we'd be a little grateful for that. And further, I wanted to mention, too, that we've read these past chapters and so on, and we we see that there was so much wickedness, especially prior to the flood, but even after the flood. <laughs> it's not a large group of people who are true believers. And I think, again, how how great a blessing it is to live in a dispensation where there are so many believers and we can connect so easily with believers worldwide. And we have a worldwide connection with other people who, not just of our faith, but the, you know, many Christians in the world who do believe the Bible and study the Bible and believe in Jesus Christ. So that really struck me too this year again, as I started uh, reviewing the Old Testament, because I thought it must have been a lonely time. It must have been a lonely time, and I think there's evidence that Joseph went through periods of real loneliness on his own, and, and we don't usually have to be that lonely. So really an impressive time, an impressive time that these people on their own, you know, with very few people to support them, could choose to believe and to be so incredibly faithful, and idol worship is all around. So here we have, we have Joseph come into this family. And what a family it is. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who becomes Israel, and then this 10th son, Joseph, who is the, the birthright son because of his righteousness. But okay, I'm a counselor. So I have to say, there was a lot of family dysfunction. <laughs> we have some really good evidence of intergenerational family dysfunction. You know, I love that you said that. Lily, I've noticed... Something I've, I've probably never noticed before. I probably should have. But Genesis seems to set up a problem. And what's the answer? Is this family. The answer to the wickedness on the earth is a family. And they're a very imperfect family. Yet they're still <laughs> the family. Well, um, let me share a little moment that I had when I was probably 11 or 12 years old. My mother was a counselor who later got a PhD in sociology, but but uh, she did have a, a master's of social work also. So she was talking about maladjustment, people who, who are not functioning in a completely healthy way. And generally because they've been hurt. Something was hurtful or painful or traumatic in their lives. And, and their response to that wasn't maybe as healthy or complete because our resources are limited, especially when we're young. So I'm listening to my mother talk about this. I'm still pretty young. And I said, well, mom, how many people are maladjusted? And she said... <laughs> Well, Lily, everyone's maladjusted. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> exactly. You saw that one coming, didn't you, John? And, and it was like, I was like sh shocked, you know, I'm like, oh. it was such a valuable message, such a valuable message, because of course she didn't stop there, but she talked about the hope that exists for us to overcome our weaknesses and make them into strengths through Jesus Christ. And that's really the goal. But to add to that, my husband had this brilliant insight. One time he was reading through Ether 1227 again, where it says that God is saying, I give unto men weakness that they may be humble. And my grace is sufficient for all men who humble themselves and, you know, have faith in me and I can make your weaknesses strong. It's this amazing promise. That really is so much of what we're going to talk about today. But my husband was sitting there reading that and pondering on it. And he looked up and he said, you know, instead of saying, I give unto men weakness, God could just as accurately have said, I give unto men families. <laughs> I give unto men parents. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and again, there we had our eight children by then. And I was like, wait, that has the resonance of truth, the piercing resonance of truth, because none of us get perfect parents and none of us are perfect parents. And that is the plan. Now, let me be clear. This is not a free pass to be a lousy parent. We are asked by God to be as good parents as we, to be diligent in, in trying to become good parents. 
I've said before that the product of parenting is not really the child. It's the parent, because this is a journey. <laughs> this is a journey. And it's a, it's a fabulous, refining journey if we allow it to be. Because in our efforts to become better parents, we become better people. And we can, if we're doing it right, become much more like the Savior Jesus Christ. And it is a journey. So, but there's a, a balance in there. Lily, I used to tell my dad... You sure got a lot nicer as you got older. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I remember thinking just before he passed away, I'm like, that's not my father. Uh, That is a really nice old man. Uh, Who is that? Right. Uh, And I think that was. Who did you become? Yeah. It was part of the, like you said, it was part of the process. So let's just make a quick review. Okay. So we're going back to Abraham's father, Tira. And think how disturbing this can be for a child. Not only does he, he worships Jehovah sometimes, you know, but then he goes back to the idols. That's very confusing to children sometimes, that bounce. Sometimes a fervent believer and other times a fervent pagan. So, and then, of course, culminating, you know, culminating with his offering and taking Abraham to be sacrificed to this false god. Yeah. And if it hadn't been for the angel coming, it would have happened. So, and then, of course, you know, it's still not safe for Abraham. So the spirit tells him, get out of Dodge. You know, yeah. you're just going to have to leave. leave because this is not a safe place. And then look what it says in Abraham chapter one. And this is so, so beautiful. Let me just turn to that for a second. This was pointed out. I don't even remember the lady who was talking about this once, but I I remember just being really impressed by it. Abraham says in chapter one, and this is before he gets these promises or callings from the Lord. Verse two was a follower of righteousness. This is kind of halfway through desiring also to be one who possessed great knowledge and to be a great follower of righteousness and to possess a greater knowledge. And then look at this. And to be a father of many nations, a prince of peace, desiring to receive. He wanted to be the father. And think how this makes sense. You know, if you think of it kind of like from a counseling perspective, he had father issues. His father was a jerk in a really unstable, (laughs) very dangerous. Couldn't couldn't have been someone that Abraham felt really comfortable with or had a great experience with. He has to leave. But he wants to be a good father. He wants to fulfill this opportunity that God gives us, if we are able to marry and have children, to be a father that is a good father and a father of many nations. He wants us to go on and to have a posterity that can be different from what he grew up with. So what happens? Well, his wife can't have a child. <laughs> so you're like, wow. Wow. God's not kidding around that there are tests in life, you know, and then um, finally, we have the handmaiden Hagar there who is able to bear a son to him, Ishmael. So we don't know how old Ishmael was, but finally, when Sarah conceives a child, God tells Abraham, send Ishmael away. Can you imagine how that felt to him? Are you kidding? I want to be a good father. Not like the father I had. I want to be a good father. And now you want me to be a bad father? <laughs> you want me to reject this child? It must have been such an amazing test. Maybe part of that Abrahamic test even started there. And then God makes him a promise. Don't worry. I'm going to take care of him and his mother and he'll become a great nation. So then he has this child of promise, Isaac. Must have been so filled with joy. Now, he didn't get a lot of children, but okay, he has this child of promise and Isaac is a righteous man now. And Isaac's about 35-ish probably. Then God says, okay, now sacrifice. Do to Isaac what your father tried to do to you, but don't worry because I'm the real God. Like, I mean, are we aware of what an Abraham te- Abrahamic test really is? Like it gets us right in our, in our hangups. Like God wants us to overcome. That's his trauma from his childhood. That's his trauma. <laughs> and That's his trauma. And God's I've like, tried a long time to forget this. <laughs> That's right. <Yeah. laughs> That's right. And he's like, no, I can make your weaknesses strong. We can, we can overcome all of this. We can overcome all this. And you know what? It says so beautifully that Abraham got up early the next morning to comply with that. I mean, some of us would have slept in, you know, <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe I'm not in a hurry to go and do this, but Abraham has such an amazing trust uh, in God and, and is so, so fixed in his righteousness that I will do what the Lord commands, you know, even though this is hitting right on the soft spot, you know. 
So he goes, and of course we know that it is not required that he fulfill that, but he passes the test. Isaac also must have had a pretty traumatic test there because, um, you know, he probably easily could have wrestled that knife away from his aged father, but he was willing to submit because he also has this great testimony and becomes the next great patriarch. But look at the next hang up. He has twins and he favors one. Never, never a great dynamic, never a great dynamic, but he just has this sort of kinship with Esau, who's an outdoors guy. (laughs) Isaac kind of connects and Jacob's a great guy, but really a great guy because he is righteous and Esau really isn't. And he marries outside the covenant. Rebecca has to use some subterfuge to, um, to get the birthright blessing to Jacob. Now, I've, I've mentioned this, and I'm sure this has been just talked about, but I just want to review that obviously you can't steal a birthright. I mean, God would not endorse a stolen birthright. Isaac was, was a little weak in this particular place. It's just hit on his soft spot, I suppose, but, but um, he gets it. And when Esau comes and says, are you not going to bless me? I mean, and have you nothing left for me? And Isaac could have said, no, your brother stole it. I'm giving you the real birthright. I mean, there was, would have been nothing to stop him from conferring a birthright on Esau had Esau deserved it and been worthy and righteous. But the trick there just was to, you know, just kind of brought Isaac's awareness again to the forefront that like, no, Jacob is the birthright son. But now Esau wants to kill Jacob, so Jacob has to also leave town. <laughs> so we're, we're still seeing a lot of trauma here. Yeah. This is a fun, this is a, what is a fun and dysfunctional? This is, wow. Uh, we are. <laughs> fun and dysfunctional. Wow. <laughs> it just, okay, I'm going to make some conclusions here in a moment. But, but we see him now go to his uncle Laban. And Laban's a son of a god. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he loves Rachel, it works seven years, and gets Leah. And look at the dysfunction that comes between those two sisters. Because even though, okay, well, I'll stay with Leah for a week, and then uh, then I'll, I'll let you marry Rachel, who was really the love of Jacob. And now Leah is jealous. But now Rachel's jealous, too, because Leah can have children and she can't. So, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of competition. And this goes on through the chapters. We, we read about that, right? Even that one time that Leah's son comes back with mandrakes and Rachel's like, hey, can I have some? No, you already have my husband. I'm not going to give you my mandrakes, too. And and she says, well, OK, I'll just switch this and Jacob can sleep t- with you tonight. <laughs> it's like, I mean, this It's pretty bizarre stuff. Now, it is a sketchy record, but we see this. We see this. And it even says of Leah that she was hated, that she was hated. You think the sons didn't know that? So these sons of Jacob that are born to Leah and then to Bilhah and Zilpah competing to have children, because that's why Rachel says, well, here, maybe my handmaid can can give you children for me. And then Leah does the same. And then Leah has a couple more. And you know, it says of Leah, it's so sad. It says, maybe now my husband will love me because I've given him six sons. I mean, she's still, all these years later, she's still like, maybe now he'll stay with me. So there's a lot of pain here. Trouble continues. Now we have Joseph who comes in and he's hated by his older brothers. Because not only is he the child of Jacob's old age, but he's the child of Rachel. And... Let's give him credit where credit's due. Joseph is good. Joseph is righteous. The other brothers are not. I mean, they represent the 12 tribes of Israel, but that doesn't mean they were righteous. You know, Reuben has defiled his father's bed with Bilhah, and they all have their issues, and they don't like Jacob. And, uh, you know, maybe they just saw how much pain that their mothers went through, and particularly Leah, for being the non-favored wife. I, I'm feeling a little bit better about the drama in my family, <laughs> both the family I grew up in and the family I have now. I'm like, OK, that's it's, maybe it's to be expected. A little drama, a little jealousy, a little some problems, some hatred. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I think I've used that word and you used it a few times here, dysfunction. And maybe we ought to define it because I've used it because I think I know what it means. It's like not functioning. <laughs> right. But what what is dysfunction? Well, yeah, it means it means you know, unhealthy ways of responding. So, you know, we talk about hangups, you know, from decades ago, we used that word hangups. Everybody has hangups. And that really is the same thing. It means that I was hurt in a certain area and my response to it wasn't that great. And how could it have been? Like, especially because a lot of these traumas happen when we're young and they may not be like 
full blown traumas, but they're hurt and you know, there's jealousies within families or parents have their own stuff. And if we go back a generation, like we are just talking about this generation after generation of, of pain, we can understand why people don't handle things perfectly because things weren't handled perfectly for them either. So they end up with these hangups and then they pass them along, not because they're bad people. I do want to mention specifically, and I think this is really important, that we, we kind of find a sweet spot in the middle of all this, meaning that we need to, to make some decisions. For instance, it's not okay to just say, well, then I have a free pass to be a crummy parent. No, we don't. We don't. <laughs> we, we are responsible. I can blame my past. I can blame my behavior on my past. Yeah, we, we are responsible. And there are, again, you know, some amazing examples of people who, like these people we're talking about, who did have injuries in their youth or in their lives, but didn't let that give them an excuse for becoming, you know, slugs or, or terrible people or angry people or vicious breakers of, the co- of their covenant. Like, no, like, I, I want to be good. <laughs> I still want to be good. And I'm going to allow that healing process to continue in me and trust in the Lord that he can make my weaknesses into strengths if I, if I pursue this path. So no free pass on, on being a lousy parent. We, I hope we're all diligent in those efforts. But again, the sweet spot is not expecting ourselves to be perfect and, and recognizing that, okay, our kids may end up with a few hangups that, that we developed. Well, we, we need to be as supportive and accepting of that as we can, but that doesn't mean that we, what we condone sin doesn't mean that we just throw out the rules and say that like, well, you know, because life is hard, doesn't matter if you're good. Yes, it does. It, it absolutely matters. That's kind of, again, that's the point is can we through all the tribulation of this life, continue to choose Christ, to continue to come to Christ and be saved. There is this sweet spot. We, like you said, we don't want to blame. We don't want to act like that gives me a free pass to be a jerk myself <laughs> or to be unkind or, or messed up. We should be working toward the, the functional life that God wants and that he invites us all to have. Another point, though, however, is that is to not deny that we're hurt. Like it helps to recognize those things and to process them through prayer, through some cathartic writing, perhaps. But anyway, there are lots of things that and there are other resources that can help us to process that pain. But denying it is not a good idea. Every once in a while, I'll see clients who maybe have a toxic mother or a toxic father, an abusive parent, one of them or both. Maybe somebody who's incredibly critical and really did a lot of damage when they were growing up because it really affected their self-image and created some serious insecurities. And they'll say, but my parents are really wonderful people and I need to honor my father and mother. So they keep going to visit a lot and they spend a lot of time with those parents who are still hurtful. And I'm like, hang on. That's not required either. Honoring your father and mother doesn't mean that you have to put yourself in harm's way. So if you have an unhealthy relationship where there really is abuse, I'm not talking about imperfection here, but I'm talking about toxic stuff. Somebody who is really cruel or unkind or or degrading or demeaning or dangerous in some way, then don't put yourself in their path. Abraham left because his father was toxic. And that's not a bad pattern. It didn't mean that he didn't honor his father, but that honoring our father and mother doesn't mean that we're going to agree with them that we're going to ignore things that aren't correct or that are dangerous. So so there is that sweet spot. Like I said, I think we can find it. I know we can find it. And if we need help, we should get help. But, but we can find that space where we're safe. And, and I would say that honoring our father and mother means that we can always be grateful for life. They gave us life. They were the instruments through which we come to the earth. If we've made it to adulthood, that's a blessing. That's a blessing. And our parents probably taught us some things that were valuable. Sometimes, I mean, I remember talking to a guy whose father was really abusive, but he said, you know what? He was such a hard worker and I learned to work from my dad. And I'll always be grateful for that. And we can have compassion for the fact that like they were hurt too, because what do we say? Hurt people, hurt people. So we can have some compassion and we don't have to try to condemn. We don't know enough to condemn. God's going to take all of the right stuff into consideration. He sees everything perfectly in the heart, in the mind, and all the circumstances. So we don't have to worry about that. And it's not our business to make a final judgment about our parents, but we need to make an intermediate judgment and say, is it safe for me to continue to have a relationship with them or not? And I don't have to believe everything that they believe. I need to believe what the Lord tells me to believe. That's what Abraham did. Great example of that, by the way. 
And these men all chose to follow God in spite of whatever hurts. So that's that's the takeaway. Find that sweet spot. Too often we have a victim mentality in our world where, as you were saying, John, that it's just like, well, it's my mother's fault, my father's fault, or the devil made me do it. Therefore, yeah, therefore I, I give up. Yeah, I give up. I'm not responsible. The free pass, the you free said. Pass. See? And then don't give up on the, on the goal because we are in a dispensation now where we have the opportunity to try to build Zion families. We can choose that path and teach the principles of Zion. And yes, encourage our children. They'll choose for themselves as children do, but we can, we can give them a good start. And there, this is the time. This is the time. We are invited now to establish Zion individually. We're not called as a group yet. The prophet will call when the time is, is right. But individually, we have everything we need. We have the covenants of the temple. We have access to the priesthood powers. We, we can work to be Zion. So don't give up just because life is hard. So find that sweet spot. Harold B. Lee used to say, the gospel of Jesus Christ is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so let's find that sweet spot. Like be comforted in our imperfection and the imperfections of our families, the dysfunctions. But but let's let's not get too comfortable with that. Let's keep working on improvement. The Lord can heal. He can heal all our wounds. What an amazing gift that is. And we sell ourselves short if and we sell the Lord short if we don't work to to receive that great gift of healing. It's it's available. It's totally available. So don't settle. Don't be a victim. Yeah, I, I really like this. It's like, uh, yeah, this is we live in a fallen world and families are going to have problems. Make sure you're inserting compassion and repentance into the equation every day. Compassion for others, for yourself. Try to repent. Turn it around just every day. I think for me as a parent, if I can keep inserting compassion and repentance, I can have access to that healing power. I like too that Lily said, but it comes to a point where if it's toxic, it you, you got to go. And that's Abraham just left. And Nephi, after Lehi died, just I have to go. I like that idea of a sweet spot. If it gets toxic, you don't have to stay. But everything you just said, Hank, about compassion and everything. Well, where is that spot exactly? That's that's the challenge, finding the sweet spot. John, I tell my kids that all the time when they so-and-so hurt me, so-and-so hurt me. I'm trying to remember hurt people, hurt people. There's something going on with them. Another thing I say is that healthy people never attack. And that's a good one for your kids too, for all of us. But kids need to know that, that people aren't in a good place when they're attacking. So let's, again, know what's going on here. And that, that's incredibly helpful if we realize that the only one who can really define us is God. So if we can, if we can go to God and, and let him reveal to us who we really are, we're safe. The, the other voices, however well intended they are, are not going to give us a perfect idea of who we are anyway. Yes, who sees us clearly but God. Don't let ourselves get defined by other people. And I really believe that that's what happens here in this dynasty, is that these people were, they let themselves be defined by God, which doesn't mean there weren't still these hangups that show up every once in a while. And then we talk about Joseph comes into a tough situation. His mother is the loved one, but there has been all this tension in the family. And he's already got these 10 brothers who are just poised to hate him. The one thing they've got going is that Rachel doesn't have children. And then she has a son. He didn't even have to do anything to be a hiss and a byword in the family. And then he's righteous. And Jacob loves him. It says he loved him because he was a child of his old age, but that's not the only reason. He loves him because he's a child of promise, because he's willing to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ and to live it. So Jacob who's had, has all these other sons who are really not interested in that, you know, and I mean, think about it. They're, they're surrounded by idolatry. This is a lonely path, not like today, where we have lots of good people if we choose to seek them out. But they were on their own. Even Laban, Rachel's and Leah's father had his little images, remember? <laughs> he has his idols. And when he comes chasing after Jacob, he wants them back. And you're like, wait a minute, you knew, you knew better. And he did know better. But anyway, so they're surrounded by this stuff all the time. And the brothers all kind of cave into it at one level or another. And then they all hate J Joseph, who then let's be clear, he's about 17 by the time he's sold into 
slavery, but he's not super mature or wise about handling those dreams. (laughs) (laughs) He has not read how to win friends and influence people. Could he have been a little diplomatic and maybe just told that to his father, who didn't even like the second dream where the sun and the moon bow to his star as well, that his mother and father. And even Jacob is a little bit tweaked at that. And he's like, really? Shall my mother and I bow down to thee? But then it says that he remembered those things. He kept them. So he knew that there was a prophecy coming or that, you know, in those dreams. And he knew that Joseph was this child of promise. He's, he's a little a little irritated, perhaps, by, by the blunt nature of the dream. And Joseph's not very wise. He's not. I mean, and, and I remember we was talking about this with with his son and daughter-in-law and some of their kids. And my son turned to his kids and he goes, see, and I talk about that, don't I? You don't have to tell people everything. Yeah, <laughs> That's do. actually good advice. Yeah. Sometimes we should keep our own counsel and uh, <laughs> not. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm a talker, so I'm sympathetic to Joseph. <laughs> yeah. I've always thought that, Lily, that this is probably a bad move on his part, but it doesn't warrant the response <laughs> that he gets. Uh, fair enough. Right. That's fair enough. Uh, I mean, uh-huh. Telling That's, someone uh, your dreams is, and being a little unwise <laughs> does not warrant <laughs> We need to kill you, sell you, whatever, get him. rid of you. Yeah. <laughs> Let's kill him. Yeah, it's a, it's a big response. And then you even wonder, I mean, at least I did. I'm like, you know, was it a good idea for Jacob to send him to go check on his brothers? <laughs> was he really that unaware, you know, that... Uh... Anyway, whatever the case is, there is prophecy to be fulfilled, and God did have a plan. I, I want to mention this, too, that God works through everybody, righteous and unrighteous. He uses the brothers. To, to accomplish an, an amazing salvation of Israel and these tribes that become the covenant people of the Lord. It's pretty amazing how all of this is good. God's economy. He's, he's so economical. We just accomplish it this way, even though, you know, as it says, and this is in Matthew 18, right, that it says, you know, there must needs be offenses, but woe unto him by whom the offense cometh. Like the Lord will use our behaviors, good or bad, to accomplish his purposes. But there will be an accountability for people who sin. Joseph is sold into slavery and thus begins 13 years, give or take, of real trouble for Joseph. There are tender mercies in the trouble, but this is real trouble. Let's mention the coat for a moment. I'm just going to say that, of course, the coat was a mark of of Jacob's not just love, but acceptance of Joseph as the birthright son. Hugh Nibley makes an interesting statement about this in some of his writings. He says this was not just a coat of many colors. In fact, he says in the original text and so on, it doesn't really mention colors, not to ruin the musical for anybody. But (laughs) he said it was the priesthood garment that had been handed down in the family, and it had marks in it. And he said, instead of colors, it really is extra threads, extra embroidery that created the marks of the garment. So interesting. And they say that when the brothers bring the garment to Jacob, stained with blood, that Jacob was blind by then. And what he felt were the marks of the garment. And that's why he knew it was Joseph's. It was a very powerful symbol to everybody that Joseph was the child of promise in this family and was worthy of that, of that birthright. You bring up Hugh Nibley and it made me think of Alma chapter 46, where there's this really almost random story that if you read Genesis, you don't get this in Genesis, but Captain Moroni seems to have a story about Joseph's coat. He says, uh, this is Alma 46, 23, Moroni said unto them, behold, we are a remnant of the seed of Jacob. We are a remnant of the seed of Joseph, whose coat was rent by his brethren into many pieces. Now behold, let us remember to keep the commandments of God in our garments, or our garments shall be rent by our brethren. And then he talks about uh, this, this prophecy that's not in Genesis anywhere. This is verse 20 four, let's remember the words of Jacob before his death. For behold, he saw that a part of the remnant of the coat of Joseph was preserved and had not decayed. And he felt that that was a sign that a remnant of the seed of Joseph would be preserved by the hand of God. And then I, I all of a sudden you brought up Hugh Nibley and I thought, oh, Hugh Nibley talked about this very thing. He said that, quote, in the 10th century A.D., I have no idea how to say this, uh, Muhammad ibn Ibrahim Atta Labi, 
I'm sure I did not do that right. A Muslim scholar gathered legends about many ancient biblical figures. He preserved one account not found anywhere else about the code of Joseph, telling how it was torn and how a remnant uh, remained undecayed and what that meant. That lore, Hugh Nibley says, is preserved nowhere else except Alma 46. Nibley said, described it as a quote, a test no forgery could pass. Right. Anyway, a little shout out to the Book of Mormon and just kind of a, a side tangent. So uh, maybe some of our listeners might find that interesting. Oh, I like great. it. I like it. And I think there is great symbolism in all that. The Lord speaks through those, those symbols. That's, that's beautiful connection. I want to just talk about now why bad things happen to good people <laughs> as we talk about this next stage uh, of, of oh. Joseph's life. You know, he's, he's, he's so really a young good guy. Too. He's young. You feel so bad for him, right? I just, oh, and completely rejected by your family. I'm sure you had clients like this, Lily. I, do you get over that ever? Uh, this rejection of, of your, yes. your siblings? But it's not easy. If it were easy, everybody would get better. <laughs> so yeah. it, it's a journey. But again, there's healing in Christ. I know who the healer is. People are so kind. They want to give credit to the counselor sometimes. And I'm like, I know who the healer is. And you did the work. I'm happy to be a facilitator of that. It is such a privilege to do that. But I know who the healer is. And I know we can heal. I know that ultimate healing comes in the resurrection. So we also need not to be impatient about it. Because it's a journey. We really can do a lot of healing. So don't don't give up. There needs to be this, this hope in Christ that is hope, of course, for a glorious resurrection, but also hope that our wounds will be healed. And I, and I want to talk more about that kind of as we wrap up in a way, because there's some really, really wonderful kind of culminating messages of hope that, that we should all take away from this story, right? Growing up with this story and watching the musical, it makes it just so fun. <laughs> I don't know how old I was before I realized... <laughs> Wait, that would be Probably no really fun. traumatic. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't you right. wouldn't sing your way through that. You know, there's the one song in the musical where it, there is a, a kind of a a nod to that pain where Close he's in alone in the prison. Yes. yes, I love that too. At listening to it in the song, it comes to that point: "Children of Israel are never alone. I have been promised a land of my own." And I saw Donny Osmond in Chicago do that, and it was fun to see somebody who. Was a believer. A member of the church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're singing mm -hmm. that. And it was, it was a, a great moment. I thought there's a little bit of testimony in the way he's belting that out right now. <laughs> Continue here with why bad things happen to good people. I'm sure there's nobody listening who has ever had a bad thing happen to them. I can't imagine this is relevant, but let's go for it anyway. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I was at a fireside the other night and I asked... It was a youth fireside, but a lot of parents were there. And I said, look around the room at the adults. Raise your hand, adults, if things in your life turned out exactly the way you planned. And nobody <laughs> raised their hand. Right? Well, isn't that the truth? Did isn't you notice truth? that? Yeah. Did bad you know, things take happen. a look. Well, they do. They do. Now, I think this is super important to understand that this is not a mistake. This is the plan. And that's so incredibly important. And I'm sure you've all heard this question from students or people that you've counseled with as priesthood leaders and friends that come and say, like, why? You know, why? And they really get stuck in asking, why would this happen to me? Why would God allow this to happen to me? And that this is incredibly important to understand because otherwise it can really lead to bitterness. And sometimes we do see people that get bitter. I remember talking to a woman who went as a non-member to BYU. This was many years ago. And she joined the church while she was there, married um, a guy that she met there in the temple, worthily had two children and her husband that she had married in the temple had multiple affairs and was finally excommunicated and you know, she ended up divorced. So she came to see me you know, kind of at that stage of her life. And she said, I've only tried to do the right things. I loved the church. I, I loved the gospel. I joined. My family didn't want me to. I made sacrifices in obedience. I've filled callings. I've, I've stayed worthy. I've attended the temple. What does the Lord want? You know, and then my life just fell apart and she was so bereft, you know, 
And, and she was just really at this quandary of like, why, why would this happen? Why does the Lord not? She said, all I ever heard, oh, I forgot to say this. All I ever heard when I joined this church, if you do what right, what's right, you'll be blessed. If you, if you obey the commandments, you'll be blessed. If you follow you know, Christ, you'll be blessed. And she said, I, I, that's not my, my life. And I said, yeah, it is. <laughs> it is, but let's talk. <laughs> let's talk about, about that because we really need to reframe. I've talked about this before. Reframing is one of our most powerful psychological tools. Look again and see more clearly. Let it be opened unto you with eyes that see ears that hear what it is. So I want to share this idea that is so powerful to me. I really love it. It comes from a book called Anti-Fragile, which I've read most of, but not all of. And But I did read the book that it was that first acquainted me with that Anti-Fragile book called The Coddling of the American Mind. And it was written by uh, Jonathan Haidt and another guy, I forget. But anyway, <laughs> they're talking about how some of our generations seem to be becoming weaker and uh, more entitled and so on. But let's talk about something that they say. And I'm going to read from, from that book. Nassim Taleb explains how systems and people can survive the inevitable difficulties of life and, like the immune system, grow stronger in response. So he's talking about the introduction of a problem, but like our immune system, we can respond in ways that can actually strengthen us. Recognize that some things are anti-fragile. Now, I'm going to pause here and explain that he gives some examples. He talks about China, which is made to be fragile. If you drop it on a hard surface, it's going to break. And other things are made to be more resilient, like plastic. So if you drop it on a hard surface, it probably won't break. It's not great for the structural integrity of the plastic to be dropped on hard surfaces, but it, it's designed to, to resist breaking, and it probably won't. Uh, if you do it enough, it might, but definitely made differently from China or glass. And then he says there are some things that are made to be anti-fragile, which, as he says, means that they require stresses and challenges in order to learn, adapt, and grow. He says there are three examples here of things that are anti-fragile. They are created to optimize under stress. That's his point, that they don't fully optimize unless they are stressed. Muscle, he mentions. Use it or lose it with muscle, right? If you don't use your muscles, they atrophy. Bone. And as we get older, they keep telling us you need to do weight bearing exercise, right? You know, walk and jog, putting some stress on those bones so that they can maintain their strength. His third example, muscle bone children. Now, that's that's a powerful thought. I yeah. love that thought. And really, it's not just children. It's the human creature. The child of God is made anti-fragile. We are created to grow under stress. And we don't optimize if we're not stressed. We just don't. We become weak. And going on here with um, the quote from the book, systems that are anti-fragile become rigid, weak, and inefficient when nothing challenges them or pushes them to respond vigorously. The modern obsession with protecting young people from feeling unsafe is, we believe, one of the several causes of the rapid rise in the rates of adolescent depression, anxiety, and suicide. That's some powerful thinking right there. And I believe it because God set up the world to be a big spiritual weight room. That's what it is. Like, <laughs> are we going to build spiritual weight room. muscle? Yeah, that's what it is. And you're not going to grow that muscle unless you lift some weight. Unless you resist that famous thing from C.S. Lewis about resisting temptation. He said, no, none of us know, you know, the ultimate strength that it takes because all of us has given in at some point to temptation because we are imperfect and all fall short of the glory of God. And then we hopefully get in that path of repentance and stay in it. But Christ understood the full weight of it because he never gave in. Because he was lifting that weight. He was resisting. It's resistance training. We know this. We understand how this works. That's how the muscle grows. Well, how do we think spiritual muscle grows? If we're wrapped in bubble wrap? If we're on some desert cruise somewhere <laughs> where, where, where everything's fine, we're healthy, there are no problems, our family is totally functional, and we never get hurt, and we never deal with disappointment or loss or, or disaster or injustice. Because that is a giant test in this life is how unfair it is 
Joseph, prime example. What yeah. did he ever do? Like you said, okay, maybe he could have kept those dreams to himself, but it did not warrant the response, just as you said, Hank. This is not commensurate with the offense. You know, 13 years as a slave. You know, no, I'm sorry, that's not fair. It's not fair. He's the good one. Why does all this happen? Because God knows we are made anti-fragile. Now, this is a hard sell sometimes for me as a counselor, because I have a lot of people who come in and they have been kind of brainwashed by our society that they're weak. Although I recognize that some people struggle, this is not about invalidating people's pain because there certainly can be chronic depression. There can be chronic anxiety. I understand that life is hard, but we can learn from those things and we can become stronger. We are meant to become stronger. That's the design of the plan. Joseph in these years becomes powerful. And I don't mean just politically, which also happens to him. He becomes spiritually amazing. How do we see this? Because the Lord favored Joseph. Remember how many times it says that in chapter 39? It keeps saying how people notice that about him. <laughs> like Potiphar notices that everything he puts under Joseph's hand prospers. Because <laughs> the Lord was with Joseph. That's the phrase, I think. Mm. The Lord was with Joseph. And why was he with Joseph? Because Joseph was obedient in spite of the unfairness of his life. And that's the key. That's the key is that we not let it knock us off our course and say like, well, you know, why should I bother being good? Because my life isn't fair. No, it's because my life isn't fair and I choose to be good that the Lord can be with me and consecrate my affliction for my good. That's the promise. That's the plan. It's not to avoid affliction. And again, not that we should be looking for trouble. Never, never look for trouble. There will be enough. But, yeah. <laughs> but as trouble comes, it's like, Okay, now what am I going to do? Am I going to cave and just say, okay, forget it. I'm going to go out and get a drink. Or am I going to say like, no, no, I'm going to get down on my knees more. I'm going to, I'm going to read, study, pray, ponder. I'm going to reach for that confirming spirit that the Lord is with me, especially when it looks like he isn't. Do you remember this? There's a biosphere in which there was a protected environment to grow trees and bushes and, and things and, and keep it protected and, and isolated. And then the trees died and it was because, and they didn't realize this before, there was no wind. There was no resistance. That's right. They didn't develop the, what they called the stress, the stress wood and the flexibility to deal with the wind and they died. So I keep thinking of what, kind of what you said there is that some things are designed, they're made to, to grow under stress and pressure and they'll actually thrive that way. And, but you're right as a parent, I don't want to, I, I want to protect my kids from those things, right? If you would ask Jacob, he doesn't want this to happen to, to Joseph. That's right. And let's, let's find the sweet spot again. There's a balance in here, right? So find the sweet spot, which is not that we throw our kids under the bus or, you know. <laughs> you got to deal with it. That's not necessary. But what is necessary is that we not run interference every time something wrong happens or unfair. And that doesn't mean we don't talk, we support, we validate, but then we like, okay, therefore what? Remember that speech by Elder Oaks where he gave it to one of his brethren in the 12 and they came back with a the question, therefore what? Like what's, what's the takeaway from your message here? I love that because that's how we can talk with our children and ourselves about, okay, now what? It is unfair. And I'm really, I grieve with you about that and I'm supportive and we love you and, and we're sorry that you're hurt. But now what? what? What is this to help you learn? How is this supposed to help you optimize, to grow, to become, to stretch your faith? I mean, faith only grows in the dark. I mean, if you can see how it all turns out, there would be no need for faith. But faith is the power by which the worlds were created. So is our beginning faith the same as the, as the faith of the end? I mean, look at Enoch's faith that we talked about a while ago, where it was so great that mountains could be moved and rivers could change course and the lions roared in the wilderness because of how great his faith was. So is our faith there yet? Well, guess what? It's going to take a little more time in the valley of the shadow. And if we respond correctly, our faith can become that faith by which worlds were created. And that's the journey to stretch our faith. And that only can happen in the dark. The letters from Mormon to his son Moroni, where he, he recounts everything that's going on, talk about dysfunction. And they're warring among themselves. And then he hit this great line. He says, notwithstanding 
their hardness, let us continue faithful. And it's notwithstanding all of that out there, all of that bad stuff that's going on. Therefore, what? Let us continue faithful. That, yeah, that's all going on. Yep, you're right. Uh-huh, it is. What are you going to do about it? I will continue faithful. Son, let's continue faithful. And I, I love that letter. And that reminds me of, of Joseph. Notwithstanding all this going on, Joseph, what are you going to do? And he, he continues faithful at 17 years old. Because I know the end of Joseph's story, I don't feel so bad for him. Because <laughs> I'm like, oh, it's going to work out. Don't worry. It's going to work out. I, just wait till chapter 45. It's going to work out great. <laughs> That's right. It's uh, going to be good. But he doesn't know that. He doesn't know his future. He just knows <laughs> that he's been through through serious pain. And it just keeps happening. It just keeps coming. Not knowing that chapter is coming where the healing comes. And as you say, he, he starts to rise to the top of Potiphar's house, which is like, okay, a much more fortunate situation than starting at the bottom. And then his, Potiphar's wife pulls her horrible temptation or whatever, and Joseph doesn't fall for it, but he's blamed. Again, incredible injustice. What did I do? I'm the good guy. I did the right thing. And as we have heard, no good deed goes unpunished sometimes. <laughs> and we feel like, here, I'm doing the right thing. I'm getting kicked in the teeth for it. How often does that happen in life? Well, it happens a lot. It happens a lot. We're trying to be good and, and do the right things, and we still get kicked in the teeth. If you're the honest one and everybody else cheats on the test, you get the lowest score. <laughs> so, so are you going to give up on that? Or are you going to keep being honest? I mean, those are the tests. That, that's what they said in Abraham, right? Where we will prove them now here with whether they will obey under pressure, under stress, under the yoke of injustice. I used to tell my son, kids, life has to be unfair or it would have no meaning. What if every time you did something right, you got a hundred dollar bill in your pocket, you know, something really motivating. And then every time you did something wrong, you got zapped by lightning. Not enough to kill you, but enough to hurt you really badly. How often would we do bad things? We'd all be helping little old ladies across the street. Well, I'm a little old lady now, but anyway, I would be, <laughs> um, you know, we would be helping people and doing good service all the time because we would be instantly rewarded for it. It would be just. And every time we did something wrong, you know, we get zapped pretty badly. Well, on a bad day, it might take us twice and then we would stop doing bad things, but not because we were choosing virtue, not because we're building spiritual muscle, because any idiot can keep their hand off an electrified fence. <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. It really doesn't mean anything. So, so God sets up this perfect plan where, and then he tells us about it. This is the amazing thing is that we read these scriptures sometimes, and then we still are betrayed into thinking that it's not right, that life is unfair. And you're like, well, did you notice the story about Nephi and how his brothers kept trying to kill him? He's tied to the mast for three days. Do you remember Job who was like said to be a perfect man, which we know doesn't mean fully perfected, but a really good guy, a really good guy. And life hammers him. And even his friends turn against him and say, you must be a sinner. And even his wife comes to him and says, why don't you just curse God and die? Just give up. And what does he say? I mean, such an example. And you know what? Job is a great book to read when we're suffering. It really is. It's, there's so much good stuff in there. And what does he say? Thou speakest as one of the foolish women. Shall we accept good from the hand of the Lord and not accept evil? Another place he says, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's like right after the servants come in and say, hey, you just lost this. And hey, you just lost this. And right after that, he's, well, Lord gives, Lord takes away. It's like, okay, that's, that's remarkable. It's beautiful. And that can be you. And that can be me. We can be those people. We can be like Joseph. And you're right, Hank. He didn't see the end of the story. We know the end of the story. So it doesn't hurt quite so much. Like you said, <laughs> you know, there's a good, there's a big finish coming. You it's going to work out. It's, it's going to be really great. And you know what? there is a big finish coming. And that's what we need to hold on to. God fulfills his promises. And all that that woman heard about when you do what's right, you're blessed. It's true. Just our timing is off. Our expectation of the timing is off. Our blessed worth perspective. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Here's the sad thing is that too many of us waste our suffering because we just put our heads down and hope that it passes quicker rather than slower. And we might miss the opportunity to build some spiritual muscle. What is it that the Lord wants to teach me here? And I'll tell you, some things that he's always giving us an opportunity to develop our faith. We can increase our faith in those times. We reach for that belief that it's that God will fulfill his promises. 
because he has said so. And my faith is going to, to be set in that way and grow and stretch. I'm stretching my faith. Tell you a little story. I was going through a tough time. And interestingly, I don't even remember what the challenge was right now, but I remember I was really struggling. I took a walk and I was praying on this walk about kind of casual prayer as I'm thinking about this problem and looking for some insight and relief. And the verse came into my mind at section 90, verse 24, that says, um, search diligently, pray always and be believing and all things shall work together for thy good if you walk uprightly and remember the covenant. My first response was sort of an incredulous, all things? <laughs> like, like, really? Like this? And it's going to work together for my good? I'm hoping to survive it. You're telling me this is going to be like, for, I mean, like that's a stretch. And I'm kind of like, really? Really? All things? The spirit came back that day. I'm not saying it was a voice, but it was powerful. And it was like... Lily, either it's the truth or God's a liar. Choose one. And I was like, duly chastened <laughs> because I made that choice a long time ago, as did the rest of us. We know he's not a liar. But that day I needed to stretch my faith. I had faith. I had faith. But it didn't stretch over this particular trial because I was, I was struggling. So I thought I need to stretch my faith in this area and believe that this will work together for my good. I mean, can you imagine the promise of that verse? All things shall work together for thy good. All things. God doesn't lie. So when we can't see, that's when we have a chance to believe. That's what faith is, is believing when we can't see. We don't see the end of our personal story, except that God does give us a pretty good preview, which is that, you know what? It's going to be great. I have not seen, neither ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Trust me on this. It's going to be amazing. Hold on. Hold on. Don't let go of that iron rod. Don't let go of your faith. Stretch your faith. Keep growing. Another thing that can always grow in struggles is patience. We can grow our faith. We can grow our patience. Long suffering is nobody's favorite virtue, but you know it's important to God. <laughs> Joseph Smith gets that beautiful message. All these things give the experience of be for thy good. So there's a purpose to pain. And here's what I see. I see that there are kind of these three roads that we can take when we're struggling, when we're suffering, when life is unfair. One of the roads is anger and bitterness. And sometimes maybe we dance into that road a little bit sometimes because life is hard and we might feel a little rebellious about that sometimes. And that's pretty human. Even Joseph Smith, who was saying, where art thou? I mean, Nephi with his beautiful Psalm of Nephi, wretched man that I am. It's understandable that sometimes we might experience a little bit of that, but don't stay there. That's, that's a really big mistake to stay in that path of bitterness that taking it long enough now and dishing it out. I'm just going to become part of the problem now. Lily, it reminds me of Genesis 37, that after Jacob learns of Joseph's seeming death, he refuses to be comforted. It's That's true. Verse That's true. 35, his sons and his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. He says, I will go into my grave unto my son mourning. Yes, it's it's easy to fall into there. I mean, it's real. It's real. And, and trouble causes pain. And it's human to feel that. Then there's this other road that I think a lot of really good people get stuck on. And it's a lot better than being angry and bitter forever. I think it's a misconception about the concept of enduring to the end. I think we believe sometimes incorrectly that that means I just have to just hang on, which, okay, yes, hang on. But, it, you know, it is, it's kind of putting our head down and just praying that the storm passes quickly rather than slowly. That's better, but it's not enough. The best path is this path of really developing as anti-fragile children of God and becoming more powerful in our faith, more powerful in our convictions to learn more, be more patient, more. Think of that beautiful hymn, more holiness give me. It's all of those things, more like thee, all of this help me in this struggle to polish off some more rough edges Remember Joseph Smith's statement about, I am like a rough stone thrown down the mountain, all hell breaking off one rough edge after another. That doesn't sound like fun to me, but that is the process. 
That is the process, is to be polished by our afflictions. But if we just put our head down and try to hang on, sometimes we really miss out on the growth. So choose this path of growth. What is this supposed to teach me? And if we go to the Lord and say, like, what shall I learn? How can I become more willing to submit to all things that the Father seeth fit to inflict upon me? Not because he's a mean guy, but because he loves me so much and he knows what I can be when I'm refined. So he's not going to let me come through to this world and sit on a desert cruise ship and have no troubles <laughs> because I won't grow. <laughs> I won't grow. And I'm here to grow. I'm here to become like the Savior himself. How did we think that was going to happen? At the spa? <laughs> yeah. Hey, our friend uh, Brad Wilcox says, a God who is asking nothing of us is making nothing of us. Not exactly right. <laughs> Not exactly right. So powerful stuff here in the life of Joseph. That, I mean, these takeaways are life-changing if we do it right. Chapter 38 snuck in here in the middle of the story of Joseph that has a very different tone to it, where Judah, who is also born of goodly parents, but has chosen a whole different life path. And first of all, he doesn't keep his promise to his, his daughter-in-law, whose husband dies, Judah's son dies, and then he's, she's promised the next son, and he dies too without giving her a child. And then he's supposed to give the youngest son to, to the daughter-in-law when, the, when he's able to marry, and he doesn't. So the, the girl's bitter. Not great choices that she makes either, because she wants a child so badly, she disguises herself as a harlot, and Judah comes by and uh, hires her. So then she does have twins by Judah, and then he's ready to, to punish her because she's not married, and here she's having a child. But, but did he look in the mirror and say that, like, uh, you know, I'm not really behaving myself either? Yeah, this is an awkward family moment. <laughs> Talk about dysfunction. Here we are again. <laughs> Would you like to have a chapter about you like this? There's a Stephen Covey-like guy named Jim Rohn. He was saying, listen, in the Bible, we find examples and warnings. An example says, do what this person did. A warning says, don't do what this person did. And then the funny thing he said was, if your name ever ends up in a book, make sure it's an example, not a warning. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Try not to be the cautionary tale. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is the cautionary tale. And it's interesting that in the middle of the story of Joseph, all of a sudden we're plopped in this 38. Wait, what are they telling us this for? And maybe it's to contrast a little bit. That I mean, in the Come Follow Me manual, it says, this account of Joseph's strength when he faced with temptation is preceded by a very different account about his older <laughs> brother Judah found in Genesis 38. What do chapters 37, 38, and 39 taken together teach you about chastity? So I like that phrase you used, cautionary tale. <laughs> A cautionary tale. <laughs> there are lots of them, you know. It's the don't do this. Don't do this one. Don't do this one. So, yeah, Judah make, makes an entirely different choice. He's not living a chaste life. He's, he's a harlot. He's interested. So his whole orientation is wrong. It wasn't, he, he wasn't even like put in a tough situation like Joseph is. You know, he's looking for trouble. Judah's looking for trouble. Joseph's not looking for trouble. Trouble comes to him and he resists the temptation. I love that it says that he fled. Sometimes it's just so important to get onto safer ground. This is not the time to try to, you know, teach the first discussion to Potiphar's yeah. wife. <laughs> you know, here, let me, let me try to share with you some principles of this great God that we worship. No, he's just, I'm getting out of here. I'm getting out of here. And I think that's so, I used to talk to my children about this because we want to be missionaries, but we also don't want our children to be an unsafe or unholy ground. We want them to stand on holy ground. So I used to talk to them about turf. I'd say it's all about turf. You need to be on safe turf. And when you're in school, if you're in a, on safe turf, you know, yes, you're friendly to everybody. You can be an example. You can invite them to safe turf to come to activities at our house because it's supervised and we're not going to have liquor or drugs or whatever. So it's going to be safe turf and you can invite your non-member friends or to a church activity. It's safe turf. But why would you go to the ear bust? That's not safe turf. And there are a lot of places where parents don't supervise very well. So it's not that we want to just exclude ourselves from non-members. That's, of course, how can we be a light to the world? How can we be the salt, you know, to the earth without mingling and, and living in the world we live in and being friendly to everybody and inviting all, but stay on safe turf. And that's what Joseph does. When he's on dangerous turf, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to safe turf. 
you know what I love about this is it became unsafe. I, he didn't know it was unsafe. And I love the story that Elder Gary Stevenson tells about, oh, I want to say 2012 General Conference, the young man that wants to be in a prestigious study abroad program in Japan. But when the theme for the youth was stand in holy places, I kind of retold this story about, well, is that a safe place? Well, it seemed okay at first. And then he got that feeling, I need to leave. And the urgency of that in that story is so dramatic because he says, we got to go. One of the friends tries to persuade him to stay because they're passing around marijuana on top of this building. You guys do what you want. I'm leaving. He goes down one flight of stairs to the elevator and in the other elevators that opens and the Japanese police run up the stairs. And I'm thinking if he's at the top of the stairs right there, that's totally different. But he's by the other elevators. I mean, you can imagine him getting in door clothes down, 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 right? <laughs> so the idea of if you ever get that feeling, I shouldn't be here. Genesis 39, 12, he fled and got him out. Uh, what did you say? It's not time to te try to teach the first discussion. <laughs> All of a sudden, it was not a holy place. Get out of there now. And, and he did. And he still blamed He's still blamed and he doesn't have, you know, a way to defend himself or be believed. But that's injustice of life is everywhere. But like I used to tell my seminary kids, if it were fair, there would be no test. The only way we can develop virtue is by doing the right thing in all hazards, as Joseph Smith said. That's what builds that spiritual muscle, that faith that can move mountains, that power in the priesthood where we access the powers of heaven, we can draw upon those powers. We can become instruments in the hand of God because he can trust us. In fact, let me put it this way. I was talking to a young person a while back. You know, so many of these kids are just being so confused about sexuality and so on. And she had friends in high school that were like, you know, bisexual or asexual. They were identifying in some, some different ways. She felt like she was kind of part of that. And still was a believer and she was trying to find her way, but she was pretty confused, told me the, her thoughts about it first. And I said, well, you don't have to agree with me. This is a personal journey. But I, I said, this is, this is how I see it. I said, we have this amazing God who is omnipotent. He has all power. And like any wonderful parent, he wants to share what he has with his children. He wants us to be able to have that power. But he knows that power destroys people who can't handle it. We have to meet certain conditions in order to be able to handle that power. You don't give a chainsaw to a five-year-old. I don't care how strong or good that five-year-old is. He's going to do some damage with it. <laughs> and he could kill himself and hurt others in the way. So you don't give power to people who can't handle it. So God says, here are the conditions on which I can give you my power. And it means time in the spiritual weight room. That's what it means. Build your spiritual strength so that against all temptations, against all trouble, when you can't see how this can possibly turn out well, but you still believe that I can be with you and I will fulfill my promises in due season, you get to a point where that power can be granted. And he is kind. He gives us these little moments of, you know, weapons. we make covenants, they're all covenants of power. And they're all based on conditions. And they're all conditions of obedience. Harness the natural man, because that natural man is going to take that power and do damage. But if you can harness the natural man to consistent obedience, boringly consistent obedience, <laughs> set the clock by your obedience. People can set the clock because you will do the right thing at all hazards, in all circumstances, no matter how unfair life is, you will continue to be worthy then that power will come to you at appropriate times and appropriate ways. And if, finally, we will have access to all that power. She thought about that for a moment, about how God really does have the right to establish parameters through which he will prepare us if we choose to become that best version of ourselves, that person who can be in control of their natural man, that can be trusted and safe with power. Then this plan allows us to partake in that invitation in a, an amazing way and become ultimately like God himself. So as she thinks about this, she said, and she kind of surprised me. She said, wow, didn't think I was going to agree with what you said, <laughs> but I actually agree with all of that. And she said, I think I've been wasting my time. I think I've been 
spending my time pursuing the things that are not going to really give me a chance to become what I can be. And that was such a beautiful response. And I give her all the credit because she could see how this really could change the the meaning of her life. This could make her life purposeful and ultimately fulfill the measure of her creation. So hope she will pursue that path. I hope everybody can can think about that and consider that these terms are set by God because they protect us from the inappropriate or dangerous use of power. They're non-negotiable. These are his terms, and we get to opt in or opt out. And it's such a wonderful blessing if we opt into this path where God can then give us everything he wants to give us. I'm just really impressed with Joseph here in Genesis 39. First, he says in verse 8, after Potiphar's wife comes to him, he says, listen, I am trusted by people. I like that. In the in the moment of temptation, look, this will not just hurt me and you. It will hurt other people. I am a trusted person. I'm not willing to give up that trust. Then he says in verse 9, how can I sin against God? And really, if anybody has an excuse to say, what's God done for me? It could be Joseph, right? I mean, Judah, he has, has no thought for God. And yet Joseph's been through years of trials and difficulties here. And he's like, I can't do this to God where he could have every reason and say, well, what's God ever done for me? And let me make a little distinction. I like to distinguish between reasons and excuses because we all have reasons to screw up, but none of us have excuses. <laughs> we, we don't have excuses. God is good. And God has put the light of Christ in each one of us. We might have reasons, but they're not really very good excuses. <laughs> because, and what does God tell Joseph? The son of man hath descended below them all. Art thou greater than he? Do you really think you have an excuse? You might have your reasons. They're not really excuses. <laughs> so what, what do we want? And you, maybe he's vulnerable because he's been through so much difficulty. He's been but he's still, exile. He's been yeah. lonely. It's been lonely, but he won't he won't do it. And then verse 10, this isn't a one time thing. Day after day, he is withstanding this. I I'm just so impressed. I think there's so much we can apply to our lives of endurance day after day after day. Remember that you're trusted, that people love you and trust you, that the Lord wants to give you everything he has. (laughs) I love that Joseph has lines. He will not cross. I just think that's beautiful integrity. One of the things I love about chapter 39 is that this is this is the place where we hear this phrase again and again, starting back the first two after he's sold, you know, to the hands of the Ishmaelites. And the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. And look at verse 21. This is after he's thrown in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph. And then look at the end of the chapter that the keeper of the prison gives everything over to Joseph to handle because the Lord was with him. Let's just make sure that we understand the connections here because it's not because God disliked Joseph better. God doesn't do that. And he is so clear about that. I am no respecter of persons. I love all my children, but I am no respecter of persons. So why is the Lord with Joseph? And the only answer is that it's because Joseph was with the Lord. Joseph chose the Lord again and again. He chose to be obedient in the face, as we were just talking about, of all this affliction, all this injustice. God was still chosen by Joseph. He keeps choosing God. He uses his agency every time. I want all to have this invitation, but only the ones who keep choosing God are able to receive this amazing blessing that God is with us. The Lord is with us. And even in our difficulties, there will be tender mercies. We can prosper. I mean, we can be refined. We can become the best version of ourselves in this moment. That's what's happening to Joseph. He's becoming a better and better version of himself. Anti-fragile. Please join us for part two of this podcast.